<laughs> Who was the voice? <laughs> okay. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the weakness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled be fulfilled, fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live for as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage against to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption to, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. What a wonderful scripture. And it shows the really this morning as a reminder how essential it is for the Holy Spirit to, in the Christian life. My theme this morning, I just want to take it to, I want to speak this morning about the Holy Spirit in two ways. The Holy Spirit has power and the Holy Spirit as water. And to begin with, I'd like to just, just um, begin about Pentecost. Christ taught that without him, his disciples can do nothing. And we, and Jesus tells to us, without me, says Christ, you can and do nothing. Nothing at all. We cannot, even, we cannot be saved or do any works that will last without the Spirit, without Christ. On the, day of Pe on the day of resurrection, at evening, this is in John, this is John 20, 22, one verse. On the day of resurrection, at evening, Christ appeared to, his, to the disciples and said, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So we can see here that the Holy Spirit is given by Christ. Just as John the Baptist said in Matthew 3.11. For John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This, this course parallels, pa parallels I, with, the, with the creation story, does it not? In, in, in Genesis 2 and 7. It says here that reads that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So here in John 20, Jesus begins the new creation by breathing the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life, says Romans 8.2, the spirit of life into his disciples, and the and man becomes a new creation born of the spirit of God. This shows that Christ is the author of life 
and all spiritual life comes from Christ. He is the vine, he says. He is the vine, we are the branches, and the spirit is the life that flows between the vine and the branches. Jesus breathed, again, here in John's point, Jesus breathed on his disciples the Holy Spirit. And this, I believe, is the, is the new birth. Some may differ. Yet, yeah, this is a foretaste or down payment what they were going to receive not many days later at Pentecost. Jesus Christ is not only the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but he's also the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. He not only redeems us by his blood, but he wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power that we might be overcomers to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Therefore, to we need this experience, the, the fullness of the Spirit. Then we, therefore, we must come to Christ, for Christ is the one who gives and baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Remember, again, on the day of ascension, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in, in the city of Jerusalem until you are endured, endured with power from on high. Let us seek Christ for the Spirit. Whether you believe in, in the one blessing or if you believe, like myself, there's two blessings, that doesn't really matter. The, what we need is the fullness of the Spirit and power. Peter says in, to, um, <clears throat> in that great sermon in Acts 2 concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So that includes you and that includes me. And Peter, again in Acts, when he was preaching to the Cornelius in Acts 10, he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Now, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit and power, who was a perfect man, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit and power, we who are weak and full of corruption? We desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit. So in John, again, John, Jesus says, it's the spirit that gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The flesh, the, the old nature, the sinful nature profits nothing at all. Jesus said it did it in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing, nothing. Not even a little bit, nothing. You, yes, we can do many things in our own strength and in our own will, but nothing spiritual, nothing that has any lasting value. As Jesus says, the flesh, as the flesh perishes, so does the works of the flesh. They also perish. That which is born of flesh, says Jesus, is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Being busy bees in our own strength, in our own flesh, will end up counting for nothing. For on the day of the judgment seat, all these things are like hay and stubble and straw, and they would just be burnt up. Only what's done in the spirit will have any lasting value. Without sap, a tree will bear no fruit. It won't even bear leaves without sap. Without fuel in a car, without fuel in a car, a car is going nowhere, is it? Without a battery, the mobile phone is absolutely useless. An army without powerful weapons can achieve nothing. A doctor without medicine can achieve very little. The servant of the Lord, serving in his own might, in his own strength, profits nothing in the end. For that which is born of flesh is flesh, and flesh perishes. So returning back to Romans 8, <clears throat> this morning I'd like to say about my, as I speak about the Holy Spirit and power, I'd like to just focus on really one aspect of the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. The power that is so needful, the power of sanctification, that we might live a holy life. We who are Christians, of, says Jesus, are born of water and the Spirit. 
And we experience just an amazing reality of our two natures. Yet we are one person. We have the, the, the nature of our birth, as you remember, the old sinful nature with its sinful passions, which the Bible calls the flesh. And wonderfully, we have that new nature received at the new birth, being born again. Not of blood, says Jesus, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God, born of the Spirit. The Bible teaches we are to walk and to live by the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Now, we all know and would love Romans 8, 1. Especially, I mean, we can all quote it. As, as Paul said, you know, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We all know that. We all love that. But how many of us do know the second part of Romans 8? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Which somewhat makes the some sort of a conditional upon it. There should be an evidence of a changed life. The old has gone, the new has come. And as Romans tells us in, in, in 6, that we should be walking in the newness of life. There should be a change in our life. I was somewhat shocked to find that in the second, this, the second part of the verse is not in all translations, depending on the Greek translation. Nevertheless, the apostle again repeats the phrase in verse 4. I'm going to read verse 2 first. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, I love that first, the, the, the law of the spirit of life, the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It's something that we have to do. We have to fulfill, as it were, by the spirit. So guess that the spirit comes to us to sanctify us and strengthen us. My goal there really, I mean, there's so much we could say, but my, because of time, my goal is really to reach verse 13 this morning. So I'm going to just read from verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the spirit body, you will live. Now, the power of the indwelling spirit and the power of indwelling sin. This is the great conflict we have, the great struggle between the power of the spirit and the power of sin. We all know it. If you're born again, you know this power, this struggle we have on a daily basis to put to death the sin. To conquer the sinful passions, to conquer the flesh, this John says, 1, 1 John in 2, John says this, that the sinful passions belong to this world. John, in two, in John, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in, is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So we can see here, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, it is of the world, it's going to perish. The, today's expression of these things, the lust of the eyes and the money, uh, you could say it's money, sex, and power. The lust of the eyes is attracted by money and things of the world. The lust of the flesh is sexual desire, and the pride of life is power. The lust for power comes from pride of heart, self-exaltations, which often lead to abuse of power and to and wrongdoing. Think about when someone falls from a high position, whether it's in church, whether it's in the, in the state, 
or whether it is in the world, it is usually one of the three. It is through the lust, of, lust for money, lust for sex, or lust for power. It's always one of those three. Usually it's one of them three things. It's the power, it's the sinful flesh within us. This is why the, the New Testament teaches to crucify the flesh and to put to death the, the sinful nature and its sinful passions. Jesus himself, doesn't he, does he not begin this teaching in the Gospels? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up, the, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but, he, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Question, how can self deny self? Or how can I, in my own strength, crucify myself? Will not self, self fight back and overpower me if I do it in my own strength? How can a believer put to death that indwelling sin without a greater power? The religion of the world and the religion of men seek to reform man by a moral, in, in moral character by outward bodily afflictions and by laws and, and restrictions. Just like in the Middle Ages, you know, you see the monks whipping themselves and, uh, and, uh, and self-whippings and fastings and penance and all these kinds of things. Just, just, just read Martha and Luther's testimony. You know, it's amazing what they did to try to earn salvation and to control the passions of the flesh. Throughout history and the world and all world religions, we see this outward effort to, to form to reform moral character. What the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 2 and 23, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. They have no value. The sinful flesh is powerful and we cannot put it to death. We need a power not of our own to put to death. In Luke gospel, Jesus comes and, and he gives this illustration. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. Now in this case I'm relating to the strong man is the flesh. He rules the house, but when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him his armor in which he trusted and devours his spoils. The stronger than he is the Holy Spirit comes upon, overcomes the power of the sinful flesh, enabling the believer to put to death the deeds of the body and to live in the spirit and therefore to live for Christ. We need a stronger power, and that stronger power is the Holy Spirit. Surely that is why so many Christians in, in Christendom struggle with unconquered sin and with lust and with pride, for they have not been taught the truth of the spiritual life. They have not been taught to seek the fullness of the Spirit. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live in the spirit and thus gain freedom from the power of sin in the flesh. Yes, by degree, by degree, but we conquer it by the power of the spirit. Freedom comes when sinful lusts are crucified or lust for power and lust for riches or lust for fame and lust for the things of this world. It is written, godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain. Again, it is written, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Ephesians 6, Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. For if, if by the spirit you put to death, and we pray, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live and find freedom from the sinful passions and the greedy and worldly lust of the flesh. 
you will find freedom. Again, Paul says to Timothy, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be Paul says, be strong in the power of his might. Be strong in the grace. We've got to take hold of power. We apply it through prayer and put to death the deeds of the body. Now, mighty power is available to the saint. Mighty power is available for the disciple of Christ. Let us therefore get the victory over our indwelling sin and the works of the flesh and become overcomers, overcomers in the name of Jesus. For Jesus says it. It gives us so many wonderful incentives to become overcomers. Just read Revelation and his message to the churches. And then rewards for the overcomers, very briefly. In 2.7, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In 2.11, to he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. 2 is 17, to he who overcomes, I will give some of the manner of the hidden manner to eat. That's a mystery. To 226, to he who overcomes, I will give power over the nations. To he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. 312, to him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And to he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. What fantastic, glorious incentives does Christ give to those who overcome? We must overcome the flesh by the Spirit of God. Second point, and, and, and more briefly. The Spirit as the water. Spirit as water. I'm going to read from John chapter 7. You know these wonderful verses, well-known verses. John 7, if I can find it, <laughs> John 7 and, and verse 37, John, you know these verses. Have the Spirit of God as power, I'll illustrate the Spirit of God as water. On, the la on verse 37, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom, he, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So here we can see that the lip, that, that the Holy Spirit is is pictured as living water. Water, spirit, and water are synonymous. Synonymous in the in the scriptures. I'll ask you a question this morning: Is your heart, your soul, your innermost being? Is it like a well-watered garden this morning? In your garden, are there blossoms and flowers and fruits and new buds? Are there pools of living water? Is there flowing a river, a river of living water out of your belly this morning? Have you received the refreshing rains of heaven lately? Do you see the footprints of a heavenly, of a heavenly garden? Or is this morning, is there a drought in your soul this morning? Is there a dryness in your soul? Or worse, does it feel like a desert this morning? Or even deadness in your heart? The prophet Hag Haggai will cry out to you and say, consider your ways. We remember Haggai in the Old Testament, he prophesied to a people who were neglecting the building of the temple. They had come back from Babylon and they started the temple and they were building the temple. Then they stopped building the temple and they were building their own homes instead. And God removed the blessings. He removed all the blessings. If you read the scripture, if you read Haggai, it's a great little book. He removed all the blessings from the land. It didn't rain, the crops failed. And he said, consider your ways, he says to the people. The Apostle Paul writes, 
Do you not know that you, that you are the temple of the living God? Have you been neglecting your temple? Have you been neglecting the word of God? Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirit and a life. So necessary for the Christian to feed upon the word because these words are spirit and they are life to us, our food. Are you like the Jews of old and have, and have forsaken the living water? Remember Jesus said to the woman at, well, at the well in John 4, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He would have given you the spirit. If you've asked him, have you asked him lately for the Holy Spirit? Dear friends, another reason you might be so if you, if, if you are dry, if you're like a desert today, another reason could be that you have disobedience. You have disobeyed the Lord in some way. You've unconfessed sin or unforgiveness in your heart. For the scripture plainly tells us through the, through the Old Testament that God calls for a drought when his children go astray, not in, not in wrath, but in, in mercy. He calls for a drought that the children might come back to the living water, to the fountains of living water. The people go astray. He calls for a drought in your heart. I say, Lord, I'm dry. But he's calling you back. Prophet, again, the, the prophet Haggai says to the Jewish people at that time, therefore the heavens above withhold the dew and the earth beholds its fruit, for I called for a drought. I could consider your ways, he says, consider your ways. When the living God takes first place in our heart and in our life, then the living God pours out his living water, the blessed Holy Spirit in our life. Seek first the kingdom of God, said Jesus. For the kingdom, and Paul says, for the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Where? In the Holy Spirit. That is where our joy is. That is where our peace is. When we're filled with Christ and the Spirit, that's where we gain the victory. In Psalm 65, it says, I love this verse, it says, the river of God is full of water. It's full. It's not half empty, not quarter full, it's full of water. There's no need for anyone to be thirsty who believe, come, says Jesus, and I will give the fountain of living water of life freely, freely to him who, th who thirsts. Let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him come and take the water of life freely. What happens? When it begins to rain after a long, dry period, now the earth and it shouts for joy. I remember watching, I'm watching television a while ago. In Africa, on the Great Plains in Africa, grazing animals, they were living on dry, dead grass. And suddenly, in a far distance, it started to rain. And, the, and, the, and, they, and they had a keen sense of the rain. And they, and they smelt the rain, or the, or the effects of the rain. And they started moving at great speed towards the rain. And the great herds ran towards the smell of the rain. After a period of dryness, even here in Lancashire, it does get dry sometimes. When it, when it rains, when the rains come, don't you, you can truly smell the effects of the rain. You go, oh, the rain's coming as the dust is damped down. There's a wonderful sense of refreshing, isn't there? And there's a cleansing when the rains come after a long, dry period. The earth drinks in the rain. Pools of water begin to form, and, tri and trickles of water begin to run, and trickles of water run into streams, and streams into rivers, and the rivers flow again. After the rain, the grass appears again, lush and green. The animals and livestock, they feed, and are, and are contented again. The flowers form and, the, and out come, and come out in a beautiful abundance. The bees and insects are heard buzzing again. The birds return, return singing beautifully. Life returns 
There's a sense of harmony and a way of well-being. The earth sings for joy after rain. As it is with the natural rain, so it is with the spiritual rain from heaven. Hosea, in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 3, says, He will come to us. He, God, will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain and the former rain. God will come like the rain. So when the spiritual rain of heaven comes, the Holy Spirit, heaven rains upon, begin to fall. So the life of the soul, in a, in a greater sense, the life of the church is refreshed and revived and renewed. Songs of praise ascend heavenwards. Holy hands are lifted high. Hymns of thanksgiving and worship are offered to the Lord. The soul shouts for joy when the rain of heaven comes upon the thirsty soul. The psalmist in Psalm 86 says, cries out, will you not revive us again that your people might rejoice in you? Revive us that we might rejoice. We need to, we need to be filled with the Spirit. Revival comes, rejoicing comes when we are filled with heavenly rain. Time's going. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> Let me finish. There's, in the Old Testament, there's some wonderful scriptures that, that illustrate this in a natural kind of sense. In the Old Testament, it's to the Jew first, as it say, and to the natural. When we read the Old Testament, it's the, to the Jew and to the natural sense. But it, you also spiritualize it, can't you? So it's, so it's to the Jew first, then to the non-Jew, but also spiritual. For instance, in Isaiah 32, starts, I'm going to have to break into a verse, but in Isaiah 32, verse 12, starts off with spiritual barrenness and dryness and deadness. It says, people shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. Oh, the land of my people will come up with thorns and briars. Yet on the, th on, yet, yes, all, on all the happy homes, the joyous city, because the palaces will be forsaken. The bustling city will be deserted. The forts and towers will become like lairs, lairs forever. The joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. Until, until the spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. Fruits. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effects of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And it goes on. Starts off with barrenness, the spirit comes, and then there's glorious fruit and rejoicing. And again, another um, first um, chapter 44 again first and natural natural israel first but then you can take it spiritually chapter 4 verse 3 but i will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground i will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring then it goes they will spring up among the grass like willows by the watercourses one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. Oh, one more example. <clears throat> in, ch in chapter 51, in verse 3, just one verse, in verse 3. For the Lord will comfort Zion, it says. Now, Zion is a dwelling place of God and God's people. He, look at this, this is salvation in, in one verse. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. I think spiritually, dry soul, dead soul. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and, like, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Can I say that? What a wonderful picture of salvation. When salvation comes to the soul, when the spirit comes to the soul, things flourish, the garden flourishes, the garden of the heart flourishes. There's, there's buds, there's fruit, there's blossom. There's joy in the garden when the rains come. 
when the rains come. Have you known the rains of God lately? What about, have you known the dew of God lately? This is my last point. Have you known the dew? The Spirit asked the dew of heaven. Again, Hosea 14. God says, I will be like the dew to Israel. What a wonderful picture. I will be like the dew to Israel. <clears throat> the dew is a sign of blessing in the scripture. For instance, Isaac blesses Jacob. Therefore, my God will give you the dew of heaven. Moses blessing Israel. His heaven shall also drop dew. Dew is a sign of blessing. Rain is a sign of blessing in, in scripture. If we are still before the Lord, sometimes the spirit comes upon us like a refreshing dew upon the soul. And we can have our souls drenched with the dew of heaven. Camping trip. If you've ever been camping and you, and you, you wake up in the morning, the sun's shining, but you only try and you see it's a bright morning. You get out, sun's up, the blue sky, you get out, everything is soaked. Soaked. If you left your towel out or your shoes out, soaked a bit. Everything is saturated. Every little thing covered in water, droplets everywhere. The dew has come, refreshing dew. It's very, very wet, saturated. Or it's done often go early morning in the walking at the dog in the, in the springtime. You get out of bed and you say, oh, the sun's out. I'll go for a walk. Get out the, outside the, my gate, onto the field, and within two well, in a minute, my feet are absolutely soaking wet. The dew has come. I have to go back home and put my wellies on because it's so, so wet. The dew comes. It saturates everything, everything. Gra grazing fields covered in saturated water dew. You can see when we take the dog out, you see the, the sheep they're eating the grass and it's full of water. As they graze, they're drinking in the morning dew. Dew forms the same way as frost does, yet it occurs above freezing. But what it needs is clear skies, no wind. What it needs is stillness, stillness. Dew forms when it's still. Likewise, we need to be still before the Lord in the secret place of the Most High God. Let the dew of heaven, the dew of the Spirit, saturate our souls that we might know the refreshing and the life-giving spirit of God. The scripture says, doesn't it? Be still and know that I am God. When's the last time you were still in the presence of God and allowed the spirit to come upon you and fill your soul to overflowing, to saturate, that you know that you know you've been in the presence of the Lord and we're being refreshed. So in summary, <clears throat> it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The spirit is the promise of the father for all and on who, all, whom the Lord may, God may call. Jesus Christ is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Let us draw therefore near to Christ and seek the spirit's fullness. Let us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, being strong in the power of his might, being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let us seek the rain from heaven. Let us be still before the Lord that we might have our souls drenched in the dew of heaven. And above all things, above all things, let us pray. Pray with the psalmist. Let us cry out to our God, will you not revive us again that your people might rejoice in you? Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life and you. Breathe me on, breath of God, until my heart is pure. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life and you. Oh, Lord God, will you not revive us again, that we, your people, might rejoice in you, that we, your people, might be filled with you, 
that we, my your people, may glorify you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone.